Okay, it looks like it's top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar. Just a couple quick things before we get started. During the webinar, you can submit your questions via the chat function. Um, please use the chat function instead of the question and answer function um, as the questions are easier to get out of the chat for me. And certificates for us will be available on Friday by logging into your account. Lori, if you'd like to get started, go right ahead. Okay, thank you for um, for having me. I'm so excited to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, I the talk for today is on hypolactation, uh, what the risk factors are in the lactating parent, how to diagnose hypolactation, and how to treat. So just a little bit about um, my background and where I come from. I think it's really important when you hear a speaker to know. So, you know, where do you practice every day? What's your experience like? What perspective do you come from? So I've been a general pediatrician since 2002 when I finished residency. Um, I spent the first 15 years of my career in an academic setting where I was the medical director of a newborn nursery, ran continuity clinic, you know, sort of worked with OBGYN residents, family medicine residents in a um, tertiary uh, hospital with high risk deliveries. And now I'm in private practice in Phoenix uh, and I go between two locations. I still round on babies, but it's at a private hospital and I still teach, but not quite as much. So I've kind of lived in both worlds. I became an IBCLC uh, board certified lactation consultant in 2010 and recertified this past year. And then in 2018, um, became a FABM fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, which is the only organization for physicians um, that is connected to breastfeeding. And you can come into that organization as a surgeon, ENT, neonatologist, OBGYN, pediatrician. It, there's lots of ways to um, pursue that designation, the FABM. I have two kids. I do think your personal experience, um, for better or for worse, does matter when you're giving a talk on lactation. Um, and I have, uh, I nursed or pumped for about seven years continuously. The pumping months I added, I did pump for 34 months between the two kids of my back to work crime. So they're they're older now, they're 12 and 10. Um, but it was, you know, I struggled with nursing with my daughter, which uh, 12 years ago I founded Dr. Milk. Um, that's how most people know who I am. So it's a physician um, support network and we have about 33,000 people from across the globe. This not for profit uh, basically is an advocacy project to help physician parents reach their feeding goals. So I live and swim in uh, lactation from the minute I wake up until I go to sleep between my patients and Dr. Milk. Okay, I have no um, conflict of interest to disclose. The outline of how our talk will go today. Um, first, I just want to define that there is a knowledge gap of the breast uh, as an exocrine organ and that it can have insufficiency, failure, quote unquote failure, and what hypolactation even is. Um, and then the next part is to talk a little bit about risk factors and then go through cases. So most people, when you hear one of these lectures, when especially if you're hearing new information, as adult learners, it will not stick unless we have cases where it makes sense to you. How are you going to use this information in your practice to change what you do? Um, it's great to learn nerdy things about breastfeeding and breast milk, but really, unless you can apply it in your um, in your setting where you work, uh, it's it's I have missed my opportunity. Oh, sorry, my background light. I may have to move around and make the background light turn on. Um, and then overall, I know we have lots of different types of providers and healthcare workers who are coming to this talk. Um, I tend to focus on physician-led diagnosis and treatment because that's the piece of the puzzle that's really missing. Uh, you know, I don't need to give a lecture to lactation consultants to help them with hypolactation. This is something that as a board certified lactation consultant, you're very familiar with. But uh, neonatologists, OBGYNs, pediatricians, family medicine, uh, emergency medicine do not have great knowledge. And so I typically present from that perspective. And even if you are a postpartum bedside nurse or a nutritionist in the NICU, this information will be helpful for you to advocate for your patients. 
So our goals and objectives to by the end of the talk, I want you to be able to recognize the care gap for lactating parents who need a comprehensive evaluation of their milk production and milk extraction. Uh, be able to name the hormones and metabolic markers that control longitudinal uh, milk production. List three common risk factors for hypolactation and make a care plan for a lactational dyad to evaluate hypolactation from both sides of the equation. You'll you'll note also, I don't have a slide for this. I should that the um, I've been working hard on more inclusive language uh, in the topic of uh, breast chest feeding and lactation. So I occasionally will slip and say mother, but I've been working very hard to focus on describing my patient as um, the lactating parent because you can come to the table to bring milk to an infant from so many different places that it's much more inclusive and the nomenclature is more accurate to say lactating parent. And we, we all have to work on that. It's not a natural thing right now, but it will be the more that we use it correctly. So, of course, everyone is here at this meeting is interested in breastfeeding. You all, I, I suspect, are great supporters and advocates in your work every day. And we all want to meet the AAP's policy statement. The most recent one is 2012, that we recommend a minimum of a year of uh, breast milk with solid food started around six months of age. I, I, I dislike the word exclusive, and I would tell you to throw that word out. Please don't, don't say the word exclusive breastfeeding. I mean, it's fine to say inclusive breastfeeding, but we, should, we need to let go of that word exclusive. So this is the way I phrase it, is that we need a minimum of one year of human milk and you introduce solids at six months. So that breast milk is exclusive to solids, not to formula, okay? Continuation past a year for as long as desired by both parent and child. How does the US stack up? We're all right. We haven't made much headway, you know, in the last 10 years or so. This is from 2017 from the US nationally. Ever breastfed is at about 84%, but then at a year, it's only 35%. Why does it drop? Well, you know, why can't it be 84% when the infant is born and it should be 84% at a year of age, right? If you ask the parents at birth, that's what they want. Um, you know, they may say bottle, but what they mean by bottle is pumped uh, breast milk. So the reasons are very complex that uh, parents don't reach their goals. And it's actually amazing that anybody leaves the hospital breastfeeding at all, frankly. Look at all, if you see this as kind of a line, um, Dr. Allison Stubbe described it as like a Swiss cheese hypothesis. You know, when you make a medical error and all these lines come together through the Swiss cheese holes, truly to leave the hospital with human milk only given to your infant if you stay for an actual normal pre-covid length of stay of two to three days there's just so many barriers from the family members to the education of the staff the intent to breastfeed the return to work planning support in the community uh, social determinants of health care ability to afford what it takes to breastfeed but if you look at overall, once breastfeeding is off the ground, the real reason people don't make it to a year is that they either do or perceive that they have not enough milk. Thus, the talk, the, our topic today of hypolactation. So it's really not completely about barriers at work. You know, all those things are factors, but the number one, number one, number one is that the parent reports, I did not make enough milk. OK, so we cannot work on national breastfeeding goals unless we work on understanding why milk supply drops over time or why someone would perceive that it drops when it actually has not dropped. OK, so this talk, um, you, you notice that the name of the talk is not low milk supply. OK, hypo lactation. So, you know, trying to frame this around an organ. The breast is an organ. It's an exocrine organ. It is. It secretes milk. Every organ in the body can have sufficiency, insufficiency, right? Uh, we learn about all the other organs in the body in our training. We learn about normal physiology, cancer, uh, failure of kidney failure, liver failure, you name it. But almost nowhere in medical school or in nursing school, um, nutrition, pharmacy, you name it, do you learn about the breast and its normal physiology and its insufficiency from the standpoint of milk production, not from the standpoint of cancer, okay? We all learn about breast cancer, 
but very few people learn about this hypolactation or breast insufficiency. So, you know, if human survival is based on breastfeeding working, quote unquote, we don't want human survival to be a fragile system and it's really not designed to be a fragile system. Um, but our modern culture has kind of buckled the functioning of the organ also because we have substitutes. So the definition, there's not a clear classic definition for hypolactation. I don't even know if it exists in nomenclature in common use. I live in this world and so I say hypolactation all the time and I write it in my notes and I forget like it's probably not common language to be used. Um, but hypolactation helps reframe it. Um, I, I wish people would say breast exocrine insufficiency, because then maybe somebody would want to do a consult and figure out why that sounds so much better than low milk supply. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we cover the hormonal side in this lecture. Most reasons that a mother does not or a lactating parent does not make enough milk have more to do with self-sabotage or the hospital sabotaging in the first few days. So the, the, the breast failing as an organ is incredibly rare. The breast not having enough glandular tissue is not particularly rare. And hormonal causes of low milk supply are you know, in the grand scheme of hypolactation, there may be a smaller percentage, but it's not rare. If you have not seen hormonal causes of low milk supply and hypolactation, you haven't looked for it. It's there. They're there. What happens when people have low supply is that you say, you know, you go, I know we tried everything. We saw a thousand LCs. We took herbs and they, you just get a pat on the back and you say, you tried hard. There's a substitute, uh, you know, you're going to have to use formula or donor milk and I know you did your best and you just move on. Like you would never say that about a kidney. Well, you've got two of them. One isn't working or how about both are failing? Well, we're going to use dialysis now. I have no idea why the kidneys failed, but we've got dialysis. So we'll just move on and get that started. Don't blame yourself. It's not your fault, right? So we treat the breast totally differently than we treat all the other organs in the body. The primary hypolactation, meaning that the breast itself is not making enough milk, is different than secondary hypolactation. That comes from the infant side. So it's fascinating. This practice of breastfeeding medicine is two patients. So if the infant is unable to remove the milk and the milk supply goes down secondarily, then the root problem is not with the lactating parent, it is with the infant. So when you evaluate milk supply, you have to look at two patients. It's very similar to infertility and reproductive endocrinology, where you have two patients. You have to look at, you know, the egg and the sperm side of the equation. So there's a care gap. What happens when there's low milk supply? The person who discovers it is typically the pediatrician checking the infant's weight. Is the pediatrician the expert on the lactating parent's breasts? Nope. How about on the hormonal uh, milieu of that lactating parent? Nope. That person is not even registered as a patient, but half of the problem list is a person that the pediatrician cannot examine, check, ask questions of, and do labs on except at the end of this talk, you will be able to. So I do that routinely. Um, I don't always register them as a patient, but I use the people in my community. I use family medicine, med peds, OBGYN in the community to help me do workups on patients. So the parents, if they go to their OB and say, I think I'm not making enough milk, the OBGYN is not gonna weigh the baby, plot them on a growth chart and ask a bunch of questions about the baby. So we've got this black hole where the parents don't know where to go. You have lactation consultants who do a fabulous job. Can they order labs on a mother? Nope, nope, right? Like you've got everybody sort of working independently and not working together. So the role of the IBCLC and hypolactation is pretty much well established. You know, I don't find that there's a care gap there. That's not where the problem is. They, they may identify this is perceived milk, low milk supply, and then that's really just about counseling. Um, but when it's true low milk supply, they know how to intervene to get more emptying, more effective emptying. They know how to do evaluations of the infant suck and swallow, but someone's got to put in referrals and get the ball moving. And that is almost never a lactation consultant that has to come from, um, you know, a, a provider of some kind who can register them and do diagnosis and treatment. So we all have to work together. The physician's role is basically 
right now the hands just get thrown up and they just go i don't know how to help you here's our lactation list here's a hotline i can't do anything i don't know i can take care of you but i can't take care of you so we just have to end that and Pediatricians are going to have to dabble in breasts some, and OBGYNs are going to have to stop and take the time to do the right referrals or to know the community resources. You don't have to do everything yourself. You don't need to become an IVCLC as a physician. You don't need to be FABM. This is basic medical care of lactating parents and infants. This is, should not be fancy specialized care at all. Um, I, I this I I can't really do a poll because I didn't plan it that way, but. Think about um, other organ failure, so like kidney, liver, brain. You know, the, the literature, published literature for that goes back to who knows when, whenever they started publishing journals. You know, you've got 1800s books, articles um, that describe the failure of those organs and how to treat it. Maybe it involved leeches and there weren't antibiotics, but at least people were looking into it. What year was the first article published on Low milk supply, hypolactation, breast insufficiency. Okay, did you guess 1981? Is this insane? So I, I, this just floored me that no wonder we don't know anything. This is the beginning of a whole part of medicine that's just been ignored and I don't understand. Uh, we know all about the prostate, we know how it works. So how did the breast get left out of medical training? How did the breast get left out of differential diagnosis, no idea, but well, there's no excuse now. The information is there. We all need to know it. So this is going to be just a very quick review of how the breast is an exocrine gland. It, an, any exocrine gland secretes a substance onto an epithelial surface by way of a duct, and the mammary gland is inside the breast. So it's an exocrine gland. It changes during um, puberty pregnancy and lactation, and then it involutes and begins the cycle again. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. You know, the lizards that drop their tails. Have you ever seen the little lizards? I live in Arizona. And when they get stressed out, they just drop their tail and then a new one grows. And, you know, we don't drop our breasts, but basically they do at the end of lactation, you completely involute. And then with a the subsequent pregnancy, you all of these stem cells and the redifferentiation of these cells into glandular tissue fat, um, progenitor cells. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. So um, you would think there'd be more interest in this. Mostly the publications come from the dairy industry and breast cancer research. So the breast is a regenerative organ, multiple cycles of those proliferation. And of course, breast cancer is rooted in the dysregulation of that process, right? The proliferation and the involution gets is not correctly regulated, that's exactly where many of the breast cancers come from. Partly why um, pregnancy and breastfeeding protect against breast cancer. Okay, I think everyone knows these things. So in, in this diagram, you can see the purple structures are the glandular tissue, yellow is the fat. Women with, as long as they do not have IgT or insufficient glandular tissue, no matter what size your breasts are uh, in a bra or fitting or appearance, uh, the purple part, the glandular part, is very similar across the spectrum of lactating. Um, and this, I do have to say, is a cisgendered, uh, cisgendered female. So it, it, it gets complicated when you have people who take hormones to develop their chest into breasts. But um, if you take cisgendered women, um, the, that glandular tissue, unless there's been a hormonal problem, is the same. So the everyone should make about the same amount of milk. Um, in the 24 to 30 ounce range, unless they have one of these problems we're going to talk about today. Three stages of milk supply. Once you hit 16 to 20 weeks of pregnancy, you're making colostrum. Uh, if you're tandem nursing and there's a toddler who's nursing while you're pregnant, they'll be removing colostrum every day from 20 weeks until the birth of the new infant. And the colostrum is just made again. There's so much progesterone that it doesn't create a high milk supply. They don't get very much. The removal of the placenta there is the removal of progesterone, and that's what triggers copious milk production. If there's retained placenta, you're going to remember this for later. So if there's retained placenta, there is um, a risk of zero milk production or very, very low milk production because the progesterone is still there to block prolactin. 
Once you hit four to six weeks, you're in autocrine local control of milk supply, and it stays about the same from four to six weeks till six months. It's about the same. I mean, it can accidentally get lowered and you can try and force it up, but if you just take regular ecological breastfeeding, it'll stay about the same, 24 to 30 ounces per 24 hours. So the hormones that control it, you have to know this because this is our differential diagnosis of low milk supply, right? Anything that's a positive on there, if it's missing, that's the root of a hormonal cause. So we need normal thyroid uh, to make enough milk. Insulin is permissive for uh, milk synthesis. We need normal growth hormone. We need normal cortisone. Progesterone negatively inhibits. So external sources of progesterone can lower the sensitivity of the prolactin receptors and lower your milk supply. And then if you block dopamine, this is the mechanism behind uh, Reglan and Domperidone, which is completely you know, off-label use, but you just to recognize that, that the reason and the rationale that that is used is to block dopamine to allow the prolactin to work better. I, I do not have anything in my presentation that's um, off-label use, so I won't be discussing the use of those um, medications. So this is a pretty good slide. I mean, of course, I think it's pretty good. It's my slide, but this is the, my differential diagnosis I work from for uh, low milk supply or breast insufficiency Hypolactation really means, you know, it, it's a catch all. It's like the, the parent and the infant together. And so if you break it down, the simple way for me to think about it is, do, do we have true low milk supply? Yes or no? All right, if it's true, is it from the baby's side? Is it from the mother's side or is it both? So th the other way to say it, is it from poor extraction or from not enough production, right? Those are the very simple division. So this is why you have to examine both patients. This is why you have to have uh, maternal history in the infant's chart. I use the review of systems on my infant charts to get the maternal history um, into the infant's chart. I have, a, it's called maternal review, oh, I shouldn't, it should say lactating parent, but it, right now it says maternal review of systems and I can click pop, 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 so that it automatically pulls into the infant's note. Um, and then also for my colleagues in practice, if they can't remember what questions to answer, all you have to do is pull up that review of systems and it kind of prompts you with these questions. So from the infant side, from the extraction side, late preterm infants we know don't remove milk quite as well. If you have dysfunctional milk extraction, which is coming up in another slide, that involves the shape of the mouth and how it interacts with the breast. And if you have a high palate or a recessed chin, tongue tie, one cheek is bigger than the other cheek because of the way they sat in utero. Um, if they're even their mandibles, sometimes you'll see infants where one side is smushed more than the other. The nares will be tilted. They have obvious torticollis. They already have some misshapen parts of the head and neck. Anytime you have that kind of muscle um, asymmetry, when the breast is inside the infant's mouth, the removal of milk will also be asymmetric. I call it a bent straw. When you are nursing from a breast through a bent straw, it's going to be slow, it's going to be painful, and they don't gain weight very well. So the big broad category of that is called DMX. That's a, a phrase that I coined, dysfunctional milk extraction. Um, and it encompasses not just tongue tie, but all the other parts of the head and neck that are how the infant removes milk. Um, the hypotonia, for lots of reasons, can make an infant not able to extract milk. And then spiral of weight loss. So you take an infant who's starting to lose weight and they become less and less able to remove the milk the more they get underneath the growth chart. So that's one of those that is unfortunate. We see a lot of those failure to thrive or very sad readmits to the hospital that you want to try to prevent. From the lactating parent side, I, we're going to go through some of these in... Um, the next cases. So she hands through postpartum hemorrhage, retained placenta, new placenta, meaning that you are pregnant while you're nursing, that new placenta will dry up your milk supply. Um, so you have to do some education about child spacing and how long the parent wants to breastfeed so that they can use appropriate contraception until they are ready for their milk supply to drop. Hypothyroidism, breast surgeries, chest surgeries. Um, you know, I've had people who've had central lines for leukemia when they were teenagers, and it disrupts some of the mammogenesis or the puberty changes of the breast. 
Uh, tobacco um, can lower milk supply. Tobacco, people who are smokers have lower milk supply. Medications, there's quite a long list of, um, but I would say Sudafed's probably the number one. You want to dry your milk up in two or three days. Sudafed's a good way to do that. Estrogen is a good way to do that. So please be careful when people are asking about, uh, they'll ask for about safety in milk and safety is affecting the infant, but dropping your milk supply to zero is different than safety. Okay, so Sudafed is one of those absolute no-nos. Thecaludian cyst, I have an example of that, uh, and breast hypoplasia we're gonna talk about here just in a second. The best, so I do not have, each one of my slides, if I tried to put all the references on there, you wouldn't even be able to read anything. And I, I have a longer list, but my absolute favorite review of hypolactation from the side of the lactating parent is from Lisa Ann Morasco um, from 2014. Um, it, it's from a cancer journal. Okay, so I don't, I, this is why none of us understand things because they're published in these totally different journals that no people don't read. It's fantastic, has great pictures and great explanations. So this is a uh, diagram that I made to explain what dysfunctional milk extraction is. We, we don't have time in this talk to cover the infant side. The infant side of hypolactation is its own talk um, and how to intervene and treat. But part of recognizing that the parent has secondary hypolactation is to do good exam of the infant of the infant's mouth. When they're first born in the hospital, very often you can't tell a whole lot about how they extract milk because there's just not a whole lot of volume with the colostrum. But the, this becomes more, more and more clear in the first week or two of life. So this has to do with their ability for their cheeks to make uh, a strong vacuum. When they drop their jaw, that's what creates the negative pressure in the mouth that as the oxytocin is released and the mother's ducts open to spray the milk, the infant has to create a good vacuum for that and that negative pressure for the milk to actually flow into the mouth, okay? Same thing for the pump. You have to be able to generate, you know, a good, oxytocin release similar to an infant to be able to get the milk to flow. So for these causes of low milk supply, the bent straw thing is how I describe it. It's also a verb. I really dislike people using the word tongue tie when, as if it's a thing you have or don't have, like it's a noun, meaning does the kid have six fingers, yes or no? Does the kid have tongue tie? Yes or no? It doesn't work like that. So we need to stop calling tongue tie, tongue tie because it's actually dysfunctional milk extraction um, and it's a verb, it's an action, it's a function. It's not a thing that you look at with your eyes and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, he has tongue tie. Oh yeah, yeah, that looks like tongue. No, 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 that's not how it works. So you send a picture on the internet, that is not how you diagnose tongue tie. Um, so uh, tethered frenulum to the floor of the mouth is the technical noun definition of ankyloglossia. But th there's not very many of those, but there's all kinds of DMX, very, very, very common to have dysfunctional milk extraction as a verb. Very often you need multi, um, you need lots of people helping physical therapy, feeding therapy, ENT, people who are skilled with phrenotomy, phrenectomy, um, osteopathic manipulation. There takes a lot of work on the head and neck to treat DMX. The intervention for pretty much any infant with some spectrum of DMX is triple feeding, which is um, those of you who live in this world, you know, your heart just sinks when you know that that's the treatment in, uh, involved. Triple feeding is direct breastfeeding, pumping with a very good high quality double electric pump after feeding, and then supplementing in a paced way so that the infant can still directly breastfeed later. And those those steps. Um, are exhausting and um, it's really sad that that's pretty, you know, what else do we have in our tool belt? All right, triple feeds until we can get everything fixed. So um, it's it's really easy to just make somebody become an exclusive pumper. That takes no brain power. You just go, okay, I'm sorry that breastfeeding hurts. Just get a good pump and become an exclusive pumper and the baby still gets the benefits. Please don't say that. Please don't. That just is such feeding trauma. I don't know how to tell you. You know, if the parent chooses that, that's fine. You embrace it and support it. But exclusive pumping should not be the first line solution to either slow infant weight gain or low milk supply. All right, here's our first case. We got I'm about 28 minutes in and we've got a little bit of time left. So uh, the case one, this is this was a real one of my full term infant was exclusively breastfed, readmitted on day of life four, had a bilirubin of 21 and 12% weight loss. The pediatric hospitalist uh, actually called me to say, 
this makes no sense. I've never seen it. It was a man. He's like this. The, the parent is pumping every two hours. There is not one drop of milk coming out. Uh, no breast surgeries, no postpartum hemorrhage has a normal BMI. The infant's oral exam is normal. And so I was like, well, this, you know, when you have zero milk drops, there's only a couple of things that can be outside of anatomical causes. So I, I you know, didn't have postpartum hemorrhage, didn't seem like a she hands, didn't have a history of hemorrhage in the past. I'm like, let's get some, let's get some labs. Let me see. Thecaludian cyst, you know, you read about it, but um, I've actually seen two. This was one of them. So when the labs came back on the mother, her testosterone was 650 which is higher than all of the men who are logged in right now combined. <laughs> That's and and the, and this this the mother she had no signs. There were absolutely no signs of hyperandrogenism. So this is a a rare cause, but you will not find it if you don't look for it. So if that hospitalist had not called me, he would have just told the mother, "I'm sorry, you just didn't make enough milk." Right? And she would have moved on and told everybody for the end of time, I just couldn't make enough milk. Only because we got the lab would you know. Normal testosterone, uh, this is like when you're looking at the total versus free uh, levels around 25 are normal. The thecaludian cysts are in the several hundreds. They're, they're a, it's sort of like this aberrant growth during pregnancy. And after the infant is delivered and everything comes back down, it will go away on its own. But the problem is most people have stopped trying to breastfeed by the time the, the testosterone gets down below 300. They won't make any milk until it gets down below 300. If you get um, the testosterone levels that are borderline, like in the 70s or 80s, that's more like PCOS. So these thecaludian cyst, this is the best article from 2002 that describes it, um, the delay of onset of milk supply secondary to these ovarian cysts. Um, they will spontaneously resolve, but you have to use a strong double electric hospital grade pump from the get go, you know, pretty much every three hours, even though nothing is coming out, it's absolutely maddening for a parent to be pumping and nothing is coming out. Um, but if you can, if they can just hang in there as the cyst involutes and those levels come down, you'll have copious milk production the minute it drops low enough. If you do nothing though, if you're not pumping, all of those lactocytes will involute, okay? And then when the testosterone is gone, they've already decided to shut down, okay? So you have to do the pumping to get the stimulation to tell them not to involute and apoptose. And then this is just a reminder that the, you know, the bound testosterone is bound to sex hormone binding globulin, which is elevated in pregnancy. If you measure these things while they're pregnant, it'll be elevated from the pregnancy. Someone who has PCOS has a low sex hormone binding globulin. That's part of why there's too much androgen around. This is why PCOS is in part treated with metformin. Metformin increases sex hormone binding globulin, which mops up androgen and, uh, Breastfeeding goes better the lower your androgens are. Okay, case two. This is an infant at the four month well check who had a percentile drop from 50th to 10th. Pretty big drop. This is a legit drop. There's tons of nursing going on. It's not painful. No breast surgeries, no new medications. Um, she's not pregnant, no known thyroid problems. She's exhausted. She's overwhelmed. Her, her depression score is 11. I, this is the four month, two to four month time frame is classic for postpartum thyroiditis. So I got a thyroid panel, had the, the mother's PCP primary care doctor order some thyroid levels on her, and she had classic postpartum thyroiditis. So I diagnosed probably, let me think, three, three or so of these a year. Um, I'd probably get more if I forced everybody to go get labs when their supply is low. Sometimes they've just, given up and they don't want to know and they don't want to get the labs or they went back to work at the same time and everybody blames the back to work when meanwhile it might have been postpartum thyroiditis. It's common. Um, it's 12% of deliveries that have postpartum thyroiditis. Some have a hyperthyroid phase that then crash into low. Others just present with low. Um, and, and the milk supply, you have to have a normal thyroid to make enough milk. Um, occasionally you'll have... Um, People who have very, very high overactive thyroids and they will have hyper oversupply. They will make 60 or 80 ounces of milk per 24 hours. So anyone who has massive, massive, massive oversupply um, that they didn't even mean to create, it, you should check their thyroid and make sure they're not hyperthyroid. 
And remember that the symptoms of hypothyroidism are the exact same symptoms of being a parent. Being a parent of a newborn, all of the symptoms, they're the same. So you cannot rule out hypothyroidism by history. Absolutely not. If you've got low milk supply, that's your rationale. Okay, so it doesn't present at nine months. It doesn't present at two weeks, typically in that two to four month time frame. Case three, a baby at a two week wall check is above birth weight, uh, but at the one month wall check is only gained eight grams per day. So at first things were going fine. Milk came in on time, baby's growing well, and then it's just kind of teetered out. The baby's satisfied, it's not really fussy, not acting hungry. Um, on exam, I asked permission to examine the mother's breasts, and I tried to describe it as a skin exam, a visual exam, that I'm not checking for breast cancer, that I'm looking at the appearance of the breast so that they understand why I need to look and what it is I'm looking for, okay? So that's, for, for me as a pediatrician, very important that I'm not examining you for breast cancer. This is a visual exam. And it's pretty obvious that this mother had medial glandular hypoplasia. Okay, meaning she had it before she was pregnant. She had it while she was pregnant. She has it now. It's been there the whole time. Her BMI is 35. She's had irregular periods of a teenager and she needed infertility treatments to get pregnant. So I hope you already all know what this is. Um, this is an example. This is a picture example of medial um, glandular hypoplasia. So when there's bilateral, I think I put it in here, right? When there's bilateral and it's on the lateral edge and the medial edge, that's this type here where it looks like a triangle and then the areola will actually extend out past the triangle. So that's that's significant hypoplasia. With PCOS, you're more likely to see the lateral edges as circles and the medial edges like a triangle. Um, and together, the breast together will make almost a full milk supply, which is why this infant would have such good weight gain at first and then it just couldn't quite make a full supply. PCOS is, the literature is all over the place. Some people make perfectly normal milk supply, but when you have visible hypoplasia, um, you you're, you don't have to doom and gloom them, but you need to be ready that uh, supplementation might be needed, and they need to address the metabolic hormones of their body, not just for breastfeeding, but how does PCOS impact their um, their insulin resistance? You know, how how are they with their metabolic regulation for glucose? Um, how about their cholesterol, their BMI? So when a, a lactating parent's milk supply is adversely affected by PCOS, from the androgen side, sometimes their BMI is more likely to be normal. Uh, and sometimes they, they need to be on metformin for lots of reasons, either to get pregnant or just to keep their periods regular and everything else, so their symptoms of PCOS in check. Um, and that can do nothing but benefit the breast milk um, production. Then you have the other kind of PCOS that's more related to insulin resistance, elevated BMI. If they've had that since puberty, their breasts developed under the endocrine blanket of PCOS, and that is why they have hypoplasia. It's been there for so long. So this is why, you know, having um, children with elevated BMIs impacts you know, this very long term health metabolic syndrome very much impacts breastfeeding and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's its own pandemic obesity metabolic syndrome in the United States. So, uh, it's not doom and gloom like, okay, your BMI is elevated. You won't make enough milk that that's not how it works. This is a, you know, when you're looking at why there's low milk supply, why you have to take a full history on the lactating parent. Okay, so the PCOS, I covered this, the, this sort of wide spectrum. Metabolic syndrome in the breast. So having a healthy weight prior to pregnancy is key for all sorts of things. Um, if, uh, if a parent is obese and has insulin resistance, we now have a biological reason that their milk either comes in late or they don't make a completely full milk supply. Um, it's not really fixable quickly, someone's BMI. Um, so that that's it's more of a planning for let's get your health under control. Let's do everything we can to get your androgens down, to get your glucose metabolism in check. I send all of these to family medicine or med peds or internal medicine, because this is not just about the pregnancy and the delivery. This is about their metabolic health for their heart, their cholesterol, their lipids, their blood pressure. So the milk supply is the canary in the coal mine that alerts people to, hey, 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 this, this parent has metabolic syndrome. You can, in some ways, predict 
who is going to have late onset of initial milk production by checking the insulin to glucose ratio at 26 weeks. There's no formal recommendation to do this, but if they have insulin resistance at this stage, there is a high chance that they will have delay onset of milk coming in. So when you're doing discharge planning from the hospital and you think, hmm, when should this Friday discharge late preterm baby follow up? Should they follow up in a Saturday clinic or a Monday clinic? You look at these factors as a risk for milk coming in late or being slow to ramp up. That's what we talk about with risk factors. The risk factors are the parent side of it and then the infant oral exam. Okay, so this is sort of a summary of not all obese women have hyperandrogenism, not all women with PCOS are obese, but it's the core root problems are high androgen and insulin resistance that make uh, milk supply adversely affected. Case number four. Okay, this one is um, a fast one. Uh, there's a sick appointment because the infant is waking constantly um, from night. They want to sleep train or they're like, why is the baby waking up so much? Has not gained any weight since the checkup and the mother's nipples are sore and she thought it was because the baby was nursing so much. This is the time, the most common time to see an accidental pregnancy, no, not unintended pregnancy is around seven months. So um, this is, you should always check a urine pregnancy test when a milk supply drops out of nowhere and you can't quite figure it out. And you go, you remember that they can ovulate before they have their first period and you can be, I don't even, you wouldn't know you were pregnant. Um, the, the low milk supply might be the first sign or the sore nipples that you are pregnant. So new progesterone source is going to lower your milk supply and you can pump like crazy. It's not going to bring it up. You know, the safety of it is, um, this sort of for a different topic, but it really pretty much safe, um, nursing during pregnancy, unless you have a history of preterm labor, or, you know, there's some rare anomalies where you wouldn't be able to, but the vast majority of women, you can keep nursing, but the infant is going to need some other source of um, milk besides the mothers if they're under a year of age. Okay, case five, 41 minutes here, got to hurry. The postpartum hemorrhage. So she hands as a cause for low milk supply is a very under recognized problem. Um, postpartum hemorrhage would mean that at this delivery of this infant, there was hemorrhage and the milk doesn't come in ever or it's slow to come in. But I want what I want you to take away from this lecture is that you can have hemorrhage 10 years prior for all sorts of reasons, a car accident where you lost a lot of blood. It doesn't have to be a delivery. So the failure of lactation can be a decade or more after. The Sheehan's doesn't have to come from the immediate postpartum hemorrhage. So when you ask questions, you have to ask, have you ever had a blood transfusion? If so, for what reason? That's the better way to ask it. Um, and then how fast the blood dropped and how much, whether it was arterial or venous, um, has a lot to do with whether the pituitary takes a hit. And she hands is not all or nothing. It doesn't have to be the entire pituitary is blown out. Sometimes it's just the prolactin that's sensitive. The prolactin and growth hormone are the most common. Uh, what you hear about with uh, are people in the ER with adrenal insufficiency um, because of their ACTH being gone. And they look so sick, they look septic. So this is the number I want you to see. So what's the timing between postpartum hemorrhage and when the pituitary fails? 27% of the time, it's after 10 years. 33% of the time, it's within five, and the other is in between. So we are missing these. We are not asking about this. We are not evaluating their prolactin. Um, you know, they got pregnant. You need prolactin to get pregnant, so you just assume the axis must be okay. We should not make that assumption. So there's no strategy for prospectively following uh, parents who have postpartum hemorrhage. Should you do a TRH stem test afterwards? Should you check a morning cortisol? There is no protocol and I struggle with this, but I will tell you that when there is postpartum hemorrhage and it's severe, the milk will come in day seven, day 10, when it's immediately affecting them. And the ones where it happens down the road are so stealthy. Those are very hard to figure out. Um, prolactin uh, stem test is easy. You get a baseline prolactin, you feed or pump, get another one in 30 minutes, and baseline should be about 200, and then it should either double or go up. 
it's only valuable around between weeks two and four. After that, measuring the prolactin level is useless, you, it, unless it's zero, but any it doesn't correlate with milk supply and you can't do the stimulation test. So it's very narrow window of time that you would be measuring a prolactin. Sheehan's and pituitary hypofunction. I put these references in because they are so hard to find. And if anyone here is interested in pursuing research, it, this is a wide open, wide open. You can ask questions that are very, very basic and get it published because no one is looking prospectively at it. I also mentioned IV iron because sometimes the reason the milk is slow to come in or delayed is that the hemoglobin drops so significantly and those uh, parents respond to IV iron in the hospital versus oral iron um, so that sometimes it's not the pituitary itself, it's just the degree of anemia. Okay, so the treatment for all causes of hyperlactation, <laughs> this is all of them. Feed that kid, feed the infant, always your number one. Uh, breast needs to be emptied effectively and often. You only do labs based on history and exam, and then be, be better about a DMX exam and where to refer an infant when they have problems. When you tell a parent this kind of news, you have to be very careful about how you deliver this information. Uh, it's always a feeding trauma that will stay with them when they're not able to make enough milk or they feel like they have failed. Uh, even just using the word success and failure, just those words will stick with them and they repeat it uh, in this trauma cycle. If you talk to therapists who treat postpartum depression and anxiety and ask them how often the feeding is the root of the problem, it's uh, very common. And even when it's not your fault that you're the one delivering the news to them or the treatment, you can do it in a careful, cautious way. Um, the best way to make your milk supply go up is good emptying and frequent emptying and reversing all the reversibles. Please don't tell people to make cookies. The time you could make lactation cookies, you could have pumped. Go pump. Please don't make lactation cookies unless it makes you happy to do that. I don't do it or, or have some family member do it. Fine. But the lactating parents should be pumping more. Pills, uh, Reglan and Domperidone, there's really no quick fix. That's kind of a complicated topic. It's completely off-label use. Domperidone is being seized in the United States if people order it from overseas. And prescribers, some of them have had uh, trouble with the FDA. Uh, it can prolong your QT. And so if you are on two pro QT prolonging drugs, you get into extra trouble there. Um, herbs, some are helpful, you know, like a goat's rue that mimics a metformin, sure, but most herbs are very expensive um, and good emptying is what you makes you make more milk. Nasal oxytocin only works for um, those that have had breast surgeries where you kind of cut all the nerves. But once you start nasal oxytocin, you have to use it forever, forever. You get uh, dependent on it and tachyphylactic. And so this is usually an almost, you know, absolute no. In my entire time, I've only ever used it twice and I used it one time, not ongoing. How do you know when to order labs on the mom? Hopefully I've kind of covered this through these case examples. Prolactin levels are not helpful after week four and you know before week one only if they've had their pituitary removed would it be helpful i did have one of those where the pituitary was completely gone and this was a parent trying to breastfeed and i have no idea why anyway w that should not have happened like we should have been using an sns with donor milk or formula and the infant dropped a lot of weight and nobody thought of it not no doctor anywhere on the team no one thought of it that the mother has there's no pituitary how do you think she's going to make milk it doesn't matter how the breasts are if there's no pituitary there's no prolactin so besides that's like the i, I my old hospital was a um, pituitary center of excellence and so i saw all sorts of pituitary surgeries and problems in lactating parents Okay, social determinants of health, obviously it's probably a whole nother talk, but if you notice all of my treatment plans involve a ton of appointments, a lot of driving, a lot of coordination, a lot of co-pays, a lot of out-of-pocket costs. So you have to think about, um, you know, don't be paternalistic and make the decision for the patient, but remember that there's gonna be barriers and you have to know the resources in the community for those who have difficulty with transportation or renting a hospital grade pump. When you communicate this plan to a parent that the milk supply is low, here's the evaluation we're gonna do. I love using the phrase inclusive breastfeeding. You know, you are not able to make enough milk. We have reversed all the reversibles. You still make 80% of a milk supply. That does not make you 80% of a mother, right? You are an inclusive breastfeeder. 
Who cares what the percentage is? You're not defined by the number of ounces you make. Be very careful how you express this. And also, you can make a list this long of things they can do. If they can't manage it in their life, then it's like double failure. So you can say, look, this is these are all the things you could do. Tell me what you think is going to work, and I'll give you information about that. And the plan can be adjusted at any point, and you can stop on any day. Just never quit on your worst day. That kind of philosophy typically sits well with people. Um, and then recognizing that this is very high risk for uh, postpartum depression and anxiety. Okay, I think I barely made it. We're right at 49 minutes, so I appreciate your um, Attention, I've talked about a million miles an hour and hopefully you've gotten some new ideas for your practice. Thank you, Thank you Lori, for that information. That was great. Very informative, a lot of great information. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll try to get to the questions that are coming in. Uh, Lori, the first question that we have is, what hormones do you generally ask to be tested for a postpartum mom? So that, um, there, there's really, I wish there was like a cookie cutter algorithm. I, I glossed over that slide where it says, how do you know when to test the labs in the mother? Let me go back to it so I can show you um, that if it depends if they're making no milk or some milk. Because if they're making zero milk, and their breasts have not had surgeries or radiation on them, then you're only left with a few things that could be. It's either retained placenta, somebody's removed the pituitary gland, or it's not there at all, uh, or it's involuted, or there's a thecaludean cyst. So those are the only things that cause like zero drops to be made despite adequate pumping. Um, what, what, what I typically see in the immediate postpartum period is that they don't get a pump until day two. And that breast has already started to involute. And then when they start pumping on day two, they get drops and it is increasing, but it's increasing very slowly. Uh, and then they get despondent because it's not increasing. And so they pump less. And then when they see a lactation consultant at day seven, they will report something like, I've been pumping around the clock and I'm just not getting any. That's different, that's different. So that's not likely to be hormonal. That is just inadequate emptying. And some parents are more sensitive to inadequate emptying. You'll see some, they won't get a pump till day two. They start going and they make 900 milliliters a day by a month of age and others that never make more than three or four ounces in a day. And they pump the same number of times. So that we don't understand what cell signaling events turn those lactocytes off. I mean, we do, we know there, we know the list of reasons that a breast lactocyte would stop making milk. We do, it's deformational because they're squished because the milk has back pressure. Um, and then if you're not empty, basically, if you're not empty, the breast is gonna downregulate. So some do it faster than others. The other, the labs for um, a thyroid, I typically don't do unless it's, it's that that's much later onset and insulin resistance causing problems, milk supply happens later. PCOS issues typically happen like week three, week four. When there's tongue tie and infant dysfunctional milk extraction, you don't need to get any labs on the parent. The problem is the infant and we need to fix it. Okay, the next question is, can you highlight how subsequent pregnancies affect low supply due to issues in lactating parent? Yes. Will lactation issues stay the same with each baby? No, no, for better or for worse, you know, um, when uh, if you have, let's say you've had a breast reduction surgery and uh, you only make 70% of a full milk supply with your first baby, each pregnancy increases the branching of the breasts and the collaterals. So every subsequent pre pregnancy, you will have more milk making tissue. Um, so that from a standpoint of the tissue itself, every pregnancy increases the amount of glandular tissue you have and differentiation. Problems with breastfeeding, um, a lot of them have to do with being first time parents. So it's much less likely to have poor latch as a problem in a second or a third or a fourth time parent, unless it's been like 10 years since they did it and they just don't remember. Um, and then tongue tie, 
is, you know, if that's a familial disease. So very often if one child has tongue tie or dysfunctional neck extraction, several others will also, I mean, it's not a guarantee, but you look for it sooner. Um, and in utero positioning that causes dysfunctional milk extraction, that would be different from pregnancy to pregnancy. The size of the baby, uh, the shape of the uterus, how much weight the mother's gained, all those things would be different. So it's never doom and gloom unless you've, I mean, you, you, there's some things that absolutely will continue to be a problem. You've had a breast reduction surgery, you've had radiation on your chest, your nipple's been removed, taken off. Your breast got lifted and it got sewn back on. That's going to be a problem for pretty much every pregnancy. Um, but there is nerve regrowth and there are collateral growth. So there is slight improvement over time. PCOS, absolutely, that could be managed differently in the intervals between pregnancies. Uh, and you can get on metformin and get your testosterone way down in between your pregnancies, get your BMI down. That's not doom and gloom either. Insulin resistance, gestational diabetes, PCOS, those are all modifiable between the pregnancies. Okay, the next question is, is there a connection between SSRIs and hypoplasia? Not that I know of, not that I know of, no, but very high doses of SSRIs for some parents can lower milk supply. Um, it's a, you know, it's not listed. It's for sure not a contraindication to do that. And you have to remember there's a lot of chicken and egg when you're on an SSRI for anxiety or depression. Anxiety and depression affect oxytocin release. Anxiety and depression affect your sleep. If you aren't sleeping, your prolactin cannot surge when you sleep. If you're exhausted and hate what you're doing, you're not going to let down for your baby um, and you may resent pumping. So, you know, there's all this like connectivity there between anxiety, depression that requires treatment and milk supply that's indirectly related. There is a direct connection for some of the higher, higher doses of SSRIs in milk supply, but those are usually reversible. I don't know anything about SSRIs affecting directly the branching proliferation of the ducts as during the pregnancy. Okay, the next question that we have is, instead of double pumping after direct breastfeeding, could a parent pump the non-feeding side during breastfeeding, especially if their time is limited? Um, not with low supply. I mean, sure, yes, of course. As a strategy, if, if the infant has dysfunctional milk extraction, and the parent has normal supply. That's the only time I would do that. Um, because if, if the parent has low supply, you're, you're not going to have enough to supplement with, and you're not able to stimulate both breasts equally. Um, but if you have normal supply, but the infant cannot pull the milk out, yes, sure. You could feed one side and empty the other completely. The problem is, is that if an infant leaves, two thirds of the volume in the breast and you don't pump it and you go four hours or five hours before you feed this side again, because the next feed you do this one, now there's not enough emptying. So you have to look at magic number principles, um, which Nancy Moorbacher's principles, both breasts need to be emptied eight to 10, 12 times per 24 hours. If the infant is great at doing it, fine, but then you're stealing this milk. How are you going to get it into the infant? You're going to have to use a bottle. So it, I, there's not a simple answer to that. I, I will say that I see a lot of slow growing infants that it's theft. So it's Haka theft or freezer theft that makes the infant grow slowly. The, the parents passively collect one side while they feed the other and they freeze it. I'm like, that's theft. That milk is for this infant. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, you can do that after a month of age, but in the first few weeks, all of that milk belongs to that infant and they will not grow well if they do not get enough from both breasts. There's too many factors involved in the genetics of an infant, their growth percentiles, their potential. And we as humans cannot possibly know what that is until you watch the infant grow. Um, and you can't know what your storage capacity is you know, there's there's too many variables involved. And so I see a lot of parents who have a high center of control who have to know everything and measure everything and are freaking out about making a huge freezer stash and they totally sabotage their uh, infant's growth and their direct breastfeeding through all that anxiety and measuring. 
Okay, it looks like we're almost at the top of the hour. We do have a lot of questions coming in and someone asked if they could email you directly about specific situations. Um, you, that's probably not a great idea. I wish I could, but that creates a doctor patient relationship and I wouldn't be able to examine the patient um, so that I would say absolutely yes, you should use a telemedicine breastfeeding medicine physician for that. Absolutely yes. Um, I, there are plenty of those. If you go to the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, there's a directory of all the physicians that do what I do. I'm certainly not the only one, plenty. I don't do um, online those types of appointments, um, but there are physicians that do um, and that are trained to do as much as they can by video. All right, thank you. Thank you again, Lori, for presenting this information. Sure. I do want to remind everyone that's on um, that your certificates will be available on Friday by downloading those on your account. And registration is now open for our May 19th and June 3rd uh, webinars. And the May 13th webinar registration will be available shortly. Um, please visit medilaeducation.com to register and learn more about those up and coming webinars. Thank you everyone and have a great afternoon.